Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barry Inman. I am a Money Show volunteer. Thank you for coming to the next presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Richard Josiak. Richard is going to speak on counterfeit coins and the numismatic market and the impact. But before he does, I'd like to give you a little background on Richard. He has served as the ANA National Coordinator since 2015. In this role, he has overseen all the national and international district representatives in the ANA program. Richard is a frequent speaker at coin shows. I know that for a fact because he's spoken several times at our Metropolitan Coin Club of Atlanta meetings. And civic organizations on a variety of numismatic topics. Richard's also an ANA Life member and serves as chairman of the Association's Outreach Committee. Please join me in welcoming Richard Josephiak. Thank you very much. And first I want to say I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to help educate you because knowledge is power. In 30 minutes, I can't go over everything of what's happening in the market, but I'd like to give you an overview. And to help you, I also brought in handouts. There's one, two, three, four, five, seven different pages to take that will provide more information that I can cover. It has some good pictures and more information on some organizations. The reason I got into the interest in counterfeits is because I travel quite quite a bit and I also do appraisals and I've seen counterfeits both on show floors and in the collections and also what's been happening in the market overall so I put together this briefing to give you an overall view of what we mean by counterfeits in the newest bank marketplace think of counterfeiting as two areas one is commercial counterfeiting that's what you hear normally on TV counterfeiting the super $100 bills, 20s, 50s, and just two weeks ago in coin world, $1 bills being counterfeited and they found boxes and boxes of them being shipped through Minnesota. So we know that the, these are Chinese counterfeits uh, attributed to the Chinese and they're counterfeiting $1 bills. And you would think how much value is there in a $1 bill? It's enough for them to make the bill ship it, go through a middleman, go through somebody else to finally get it in our economy. So this is what the Secret Service and a lot of the government is worried about. It's what they call counterfeits in the commercial market. Those that are items that are going to be passed from one person to another person, maybe deposited at a bank, etc. That's where most of the government resources are worried about. What I'm going to talk about today is our market called the Numismatic a collector market. These are items that normally they're bought once, they'll be put away, maybe sold in, you know, when somebody dies or a few years later, but they really don't circulate. Most of us, when we buy something for our collection, unless you're a dealer, you're just going to put it away. So it's one and done, and this is a much smaller part of the counterfeit market. So that's what, let's see. Oh, there's the red light. Okay. Where can you get counterfeit coins and paper money? Coin shows, yes, they're sold. The bigger shows like here, the a and there's so many knowledgeable dealers that if somebody sees something bad, they normally tell the person, please remove her from your case. So we really have had the problem as like small one day shows. Uh, online, oh yes. If it's on eBay or similar service, a lot of times, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. And I'll show you a good example of that. Uh, flea market, the swap meets, you better believe it. There's actually wholesalers that sell at those places. And I'll give you an example, uh, about three years ago, I belonged to a coin club in Huntsville, Alabama, and I was living there, and I set up for the meeting. And it's at a senior center, so we're used to people coming in, 
either one seeing what coin collecting is or a lot of times we want to sell you something somebody dies or whatever we heard about you you know please come in we have about 20 members 25 members typically meeting so i was setting up with a couple other guys the chairs and everything and this man walks in and says is this a coin club meeting and we said yeah he says good and he has a case like this big and he says i would like to make you money and we go mm, are you selling something and we said yeah i'm a wholesaler mm, okay come on in uh tell me a little bit more what you have he, he says well what would you like you tell me what you want and i probably have it he op opens up the case everything in there is counterfeit in fact he says you guys are knowledgeable so i won't lie to you everything i have is counterfeit but you could buy it and you could resell it. I normally do f flea markets and swap meets, but I happen to be going through your town. I saw your ad and I came to your club because I figure you guys would like to buy this stuff and you can make some money on it. Uh, we asked him to please close his case and leave because we want nothing to deal with you scumbag. Um, but he was a wholesaler and he had literally a case, Morgan's, Peace Dollars, you name the half dollars some even in slabs and he was a call himself a wholesaler he's a most of the time he goes to sweep uh, flea markets swap meets up and down interstate 65 and he sells to people who sell to the public so it's out there and there's people that are making a living on this if you think that counterfeiting is only raw coins that's not true they're getting so good now that they're actually slabbing um, through third-party grading, PCGS, NGC has slab counterfeits. They recognize it. There's actually a display, the one or um, ACTF, and I'll get into that. That's put together. That's very good. But they also slab, or I mean, they also counterfeit the holders. And I'll show you the different combinations. So things are out there. Now let's do some basic definitions. When I'm talking about a counterfeit coin. It's an object made to imitate a genuine numismatic piece with the intent to deceive or defraud. That's what I mean by counterfeit. An altered coin is not a counterfeit. That's a coin like um, it, a mid mark is added or removed. That is not considered a counterfeit. Copy, it may or may not have copy on it, depending on when the coin was made. But those tend to be pretty easily distinguished. I have some, some examples here. We have a chance to look at my board I brought in. I brought in some examples of counterfeit coins, fantasy coins, and some really obvious ones. A fantasy. A fantasy coin is made because somebody wanted to make like a, oh say a 1963 Kennedy half dollar. Uh, a person who does that and makes a living off it is Dan Carr. He's in Colorado. He runs the Moonlight Mick, and he makes it real or imaginary coins. Sometimes he makes like Pete's dollars, and he has a proprietary process that will stamp a different date on it. Or like uh, I have an example here of a 1963 Kennedy half dollar. And most of us will probably realize that Kennedy half dollars were not made until 1964. But he takes a 1964 dollar goes through his process and the date is really beautiful work but that's the fantasy piece replica these are normally what you buy in museum shops or national parks or you know if somebody gave you an 1804 dollar or a 1933 20 dollar gold piece you probably would realize that it's a replica it's meant for just to show people and ooh and ah what it looks like so those other items are not illegal at all Nobody cares, you know, in terms of the government, if people are selling fantasy pieces, replicas, if they do copy with copy on it, that's all fine. So I'm talking about just the objects that are tend to defraud us. Counterfeit coins have been made for over 2,500 years. There's always been people trying to do it. But their purpose has always been to do the counterfeiting of the face value, never for collectors. In the past, they're doing the money so they can move into commerce. People were not doing counterfeits really to, to try to sell to collectors. Collectors didn't really exist anywhere like they do today. In the late 20th century, Chinese counterfeits have been popping up because they're specifically made 
for the collector market in the US and other countries. And I say other countries because I was in Australia two years ago and in France three years before that. And I talked to some dealers and I went to some coin club meetings. They have the same problem we do. They're making their counterfeits of Australian coins, British coins, French coins, German coins, not just the US. We're not special at all. We just happen to be a very large market for them. But they, they don't, you know, they're making it for other countries too. How does the Chinese get away with this? Well, for one thing, it's legal in their country to produce it. It's, it's not illegal. They do not consider it breaking the law. Their factories operate quite openly. You could go online, and I have, and you could say, you know, this is what I like, and they'll make you custom orders and, and ship to you. Uh, the government does not interfere with their activity. The only thing in China is you cannot do any of their coins from 1949 on where they founded the communist regime, because that will get you a bullet. But anything earlier, they don't care. They can make profits on even low value items. To give you an example, I have in my case here, a buffalo nickel that is counterfeit and it would sell for probably on the floor, uh, it's a 1916 dated for maybe two to three dollars, so the German piece. They made a coin and sold it over here. And there's actually more than one, it was actually found in a row. Oh, companies um, sell to US citizens and they um, go through a lot of times middlemen, so they don't deal directly with, with people there's a lot of middlemen involved in the shipping process, and they don't ship just to the US. They'll go through Canada, Mexico, any place that makes sense to them. There's three types of classification that we've come up with, a type one, type two, and type three. Type one is the crude method. That's the cheapy, cheapo tourist method. That's why if you go overseas, you see a basket of stuff of coins, and they charge you 50 cents or a dollar. That's for the tourist. I've told people, friends stuff, don't buy me anything from a basket because it's all junk. They never put anything in there. Type two, these are die struck, but the weight, diameter, material, they're not correct. They may fool the beginning collector. I have an example of it here, a Mexican um, dollar, but it's such poor quality. Most people will realize here that, hey, this is bad stuff. What we're worried about here is the type three, this is die struck, correct weight, correct fitness, correct design. And how do they do that? Well, in China, they've actually bought surplus U.S. Mint coin presses. The U.S. Mint, in its wisdom, decide to get rid of their coin presses with the upgraded, and what did they do? They sold it for scrap. And guess where it ended up? In China. Now, how many of you people can believe that the Chinese are smart enough to refurbish a press? They're very good at manufacturing. Refurbishing a press did not take rocket science to do. And guess what else would they bought? What do we do with our dyes? They're surplus. They're canceled. They're sur you ever think of maybe you could grind it off and put in a new design on so the die fits in the machine? Maybe somebody else thought of that too. And with today's computer technology, I know my home computer, which is you know a low-end computer, I can scan something like 100,000 points on a coin, because I've done it, and, and make a printout. I've also, you could do it with 3D printing. You'd be surprised what kind of quality you could get at a home computer. Imagine if somebody has a higher end that could do a million points of scanning with a laser system and a CN machine to make like a, a die. It doesn't take a lot of work to, to do that with today's technology. Um, I can tell you, working, I work a lot in the aerospace industry, the fans, a lot of our parts today, that's how we do it. It's on computers, that if you need one, you go print it out and the machine makes it for you. Sometimes they should wait. And they have this technology. If you don't think they have the technology, you're kidding yourself, they have as much technology as we do here. What are the different combinations that you can get? Um, well, type one is the real real, I call it. This is the um, coin is real, slab is real. That's the real thing. That's what we still have 
on most layoff. Type two is the coin is fake, but the slab is real. We have seen a lot of fake coins, more and more being slabbed by all the services. They actually now coordinate, if they see something that they never see and they call the guy and say, are you seeing this coin? Say a trade dollar with a nipple right here. Oh yeah, we have two of them, but we have three. That's a good indication that's a new fake to come in. And how the counterfeiters do it is, when new coin is released, they want to get it slapped. Well, what's the most effective way to do it? Well, you send it to all the grading services because it takes some time to process and look at it. The same person is not going to see the coins, so you'll do a dump at PCGS, NGC, maybe some of the others. If you get them back before they figure out what's going on, you're ahead of the game. Type three, the coin's real, but the slab is fake. This is where you have to look at a coin. Normally what it is, they buy a real coin, say XF, and they'll put in a holder market AU58 or MS60. Um, and I'll show you where you can buy slabs to do it yourself too. Because why counterfeit just the coin? You might as well do the whole process. Type 4 is the coin's fake, slab is fake. You see a lot of this on eBay, swap meets. This is the low end stuff, even for the Chinese, but it's becoming more prevalent. Yes. So I ran across some fake in China, mm -hmm. and they were at least they weren't ninety percent silver, but there was some silver in them. I could, you know, hear the ring. Yes. How do you test the amount of silver? In there's there's um, devices you could buy that can do the testing. The good Chinese counterfeits, what they do is they buy our ninety percent junk silver, melt it down, and make new planchets so they have the exact composition of what it is. And the only way you can tell the difference is use a mass spectrometer because there will be impurities, modern impurities that will not show up in coins of the right time period that will show up in today's period. That's how they that's how they do for court cases to verify it. And that's what um, I know some other um, dealers have done to say what is this coin and they found out that they were actually using 90% silver and making the new planchets. So they have the correct weight, correct everything. Yeah. Because remember, they're trying to sell and get you to park with sometimes four or five figures. In terms of counterfeits, we had a, in Huntsville, Alabama, July 2016, a team, and it's called a team, they were structured, came into the area had every single coin shop, pawn shop, uh, swap me, selling bogus stuff, silver, rounds, and packages, um, whatever. It made the front page of the news because so many guys got burned on it. When they opened up the packages, because it says not to, they did it, they found out, hey, it's just silver plated, or it's not the, you know, the wave was off, whatever, and I saw some of this. Some of it was actually really good quality, that it would easily sell, you know, pawn shop, um, swap me, whatever. But it made the news because uh, one thing is who controls counterfeit uh, detection and enforces the law? Secret Service. That's federal. Your local police have no jurisdiction or interest, at least in my area, of doing anything. So what do they do? When they went to the police, they said, well, you have to call the FBI which calls the Secret Service. There is not an office in my area. They're down in Birmingham, which means they have to drive up 100 miles to come up. They came up in the next two days. Guess what happened with the gang? They're gone. They don't stick around. They're not stupid. Here's a good one. I like this story. Uh, in terms of counterfeits, here's a, a $17.95 right here. And the real one and the counterfeit one were both being sold at the same time on eBay. Numbers, everything matched exactly. Exactly. The real one went for about $14,500. The counterfeit one sold for $6,500. Both had the same registration number and you could not tell the difference, at least online. The one dealer who bought it because he thought he was getting a great steal a $14,000 coin for $6,000, last I heard, would still could not get his money back. But they sold, you know, the same number was being sold on eBay. So they copy existing numbers. 
they go on the registry sites and whatever and pull off what they need. U.S. Copy Protection Act, yes, everything says you're supposed to have the word copy on it, um, plain so you can see it. If it has copy on it, it's not a counterfeit. But things earlier don't have copy. There's a lot of stuff that was produced, like 1960s. I have uh, one here. Um, I see this quite a bit. People think they have Confederate money change because there's a half dollar, dollar, quarter, cent because it came out for the centennial of the Civil War and people over time cut the stuff out of a packet, kids play with it or gets dumped in a drawer and 50 years later they think, boy, I have a Confederate half dollar. I'm told it's worth a lot of money. Confederate dime, Confederate quarter. We get all the time in the coin club and, and also people come in with that stuff. We break the news to them saying it's worth nothing. But it, can't, it has to be real. It says Confederate States of America. So they never made any. So you'll see that. Now, who's helping to fight counterfeit? The organization, the Anti-Counterfeiting Task Force, I do have information from them. The green brochure here is from them. And they also have a paper that they said I could pass out. So please take one. The dealers, the ANA, we all know it's a problem. Um, Counterfeiting is going to hurt not just this time period, but 20, 30, 40 years from now. Because remember, a lot of times when people buy something, it stays in the collection until they die. Their ears think they may have a 1795 real dollar, and 50 years from now, somebody's going to tell them that thing is a counterfeit. So this is just not a today problem. This is a problem that's going to go on for many, many years. Beth Desher, she retired from Coin World. She was the main editor. Many of you know her. She is now leading ACTF with association with professional numismatic guide. The PNG helps a lot in terms of finances and also trying to make sure that none of the bad stuff gets out. ACTF, they work with the Secret Service, the U.S. Customs, Border Protection, and other agencies. Depending on how the counterfeits are coming to this country, there are different government agencies that has to deal with it. There is no one-stop shopping in the government. So whether somebody's carrying it in, whether it's coming in through mail, whether it's coming in through some other type of shipping, will depend on which government agency has to deal with it and where it is on their priority list. Local police, I could tell you, for example, have a very low interest in numismatic items. I had one officer tell me, you know, we were showing him counterfeit. He said, if you guys want to spend $20 on a nickel, I'll go get you more nickels you can know what to deal with, and I'll sell them to you for $20. They don't have any educational background or knowledge of what makes something valuable or what it is. The way the law is written, the value of the item is only the face value. That's why the Secret Service goes after $100 bills. If you have cases, a crate of $100 bills, you could say it cost me $100,000 in man time and expenses to go get millions of dollars. If you went to the Secret Service, called Birmingham and said, I have a counterfeit nickel here. And the agent's going to say, he has five cents. I'm going to have to take a day to drive there and back, do paperwork, spend hundreds of dollars for five cents. I still have the nickel. They're not going to do it. They have to do a benefit cost analysis. They're not going to jump in the car and come to you. And your local place, what they do, is said, we're not responsible. I can't tell the difference. I've had enough time with paper money. You say this is worth $20? This person says it's worth the dime. What do we do? Well, we pass it down. Let somebody else worry about it. Also, the government agencies, most of them do not have any expertise or people on their staff for numismatic items. They'll call us in terms of the a day or dealers that they know, but they don't have people who can say, this is being sold for fraud. This is more than $500. They just don't have that kind of expertise or knowledge. Uh, problems with the current law, I just covered that. It's face value, not numismatic value. So if we might pay $1,500 for a slab Morgan, 
to a government person, it's only worth a dollar. I mean, that's how the law is written. Until the law can be changed to make it the perceived market value, it's very difficult. There's been lawsuits, or they've been people arrested in California, they go to court. What do the defense attorneys do? They get a couple of people who'd say, that's not valuable. It's only worth $5. You say it's worth $1,500? I would only pay you $5. How, how do you counter that? It's our opinion. Remember, grading is not a science. It's an opinion. And that's the problem. In fact, PCGS and AGC, they've been most successful not going for counterfeiting for the items, but for trademark violations and copyright violations. Because that is quantifiable and saying, hey, they're producing something they have no authorization to do. They're violating my copyright. They're violating my trademark. They're not going after the coin because it's too difficult. It, it's, it's the way the law is, is currently being interpreted. Working to approve, what's the priority? Well, at a lot of government agencies, we are not high priority. They are so tied up with border enforcement, uh, illegal other activities, in the scheme of things, we are not important. If you look at a list of government things where they go after the big counterfeiters, drugs, people, whatever, we're way down here. So we don't get the resources, we don't get the time, the attention, or the people. So we have to rely mostly on helping them. And also, there's not sufficient legal penalties. A lot of times, even if you, you get counterfeit, the person says, I know nothing. I'm not an expert. I'm selling souvenirs. I know nothing. Okay, we'll take you away. Okay, what's the next penalty? Community service for 20 hours. They seldom put people in jail selling it, sweep, uh, selling it swap meets and flea markets for violating something like this. They may take the items away, write you up a nasty letter, and tell you, you know, go do something like that. Low penalties. Here is um, examples. The ACTF, they have a counterfeit collection, a very, very large, I mean, you could take tables and go all the way down to that wall and it's filled with counterfeits. They're collecting counterfeits by denomination, date, mid mark, uh, varieties, packaging, you name it, whether it's slab or not slab. Here's an example of Go bars and packaging, all counterfeit. And of course, he's, here's the introduction to the exhibit. Everything in the here is counterfeit. Coins. Um, look at all the different organs. Seated dollars, standing, I mean, all these different coins, gold coins, do everything here is counterfeit. And some of them are so good, I was there with one of the major grading services, brought in graders to look at it and say, guys, you have graded this stuff and put it in slabs. That's how good some of these coins are. They're doing the class, the high-end counterfeits. They're not worrying about the type one and type two, the, the low-end stuff. This exhibit is nothing but high-end counterfeits. And they're not all mid-state. The counterfeiters are smart enough to know that, like here, that's only a fine. They will actually wear down the coin because it will sell better in the marketplace and be less suspicious. If you drop one of these at MS65, everybody's going to say, what? Never saw one before. If it's a fine, that's probably common what you would see. So they're not just doing uncirculated proof, whatever. They're making sure their coins are actually worn to um, to look realistic to us of what we expect to buy. They're good. Uh, impact to the collector's market. Well, for one thing, collectors who get burned, they will scale back or stop collecting. That's already happened. There's been people I know who stopped collecting coins because they said, I can't tell the good from the bad. Why should I want to spend my time and do this? Prices will fall if people stop collecting. Less collectors, less demand. As simple as that. Young people would be discouraged by their friends and teachers to enter the hobby. Why would you want somebody to go into something that the kid's going to lose his money or you know, be negative about? Negative publicity? You better believe it. It'll be on TV, it'll be in the radio, newspapers, online. 
and collectors will have a hard time. You know, nowadays, what I do appraisals, first thing I try to, I do is, uh, is this coin counterfeit or not? Just because it's old or in a holder or in an envelope, you cannot assume that it's not been planted. The counterfeiters are very, very good at that. And a lot of times when I'm buying it from somebody or doing an appraisal, they know nothing. Aunt, uncle, grandparents, whatever, they have died. And they're the ones that are trying to now sell something they know nothing of. Um, AC, uh, they have the counterfeiting tax force, is funded, uh, they work federal, they work with um, Secret Service, Homeland Security, Border Customs Patrol, your state may get involved if it's considered fraud and the numbers are big enough. Your local police will probably just push it up because they don't have the resources or the knowledge. There's 12 working groups and they're all staffed by volunteers, experts in the field. Current priority, uh, they have 90 plus numismatic experts across the country to help law enforcement provide them what you have, identifying the items, is a counterfeit, because remember, if you're going to go to court, you need a, tr uh, a train of custody and a lot of documentation. Identifying you know, what's needed to change the local laws, uh, what's good for the collector, oh, counterfeit detection equipment. Most police local do not have scales, do not have calibers, do not have just the basic things we use to verify what a counterfeit is. And of course, public education awareness. And they have the website. I do have their literature here. Um, they keep expanding. And of course, ACTF, they live on donations. You could go online or, or call them up. They would like any donation helps. Here's some of what I talked about the slabs. Why just do coins? You could buy a starter kit from Chinese. This is offered by a company, a starter kit. The slabs are not just the current day slabs. If you want early slabs like the Rattlers or PCGS, you can buy that. They make custom slabs depending on what you like. And here you can buy this first was selling a starter kit, which had different slab types to get you going so you can start putting in your own coins and selling them probably in sloppies and flea markets. So always verify that the coin matches the holder and the description because some of the people who use this, they're very careless. They don't care about the dates and stuff. They're just selling them to the novice. Question. Yes. So obviously coins, the counterfeit coins are illegal. Are the slabs illegal? No, they're violate copyright and trademarks. So it's illegal in that respect. And just because you have something like that, until you put it in and make an attempt to sell it, that is not illegal. How is the community? The coin dealer community doing well. PNG donated $100,000 in 2018. That's the last number I have to ACTF to help fight counterfeits. Other dealers have made major donations to both ACTF and the ANA. The dealers are work who are no cost selling this counterfeit stuff. We don't allow them at shows. Most of the bigger shows have a we want a bite list of people who get caught, and also the ANA provides. Um, education to the public. We have ANA summer seminar. There is an ANA class called Counterfeits and um, Alter Coins. If you haven't taken it, it's a one-week class. It's very, very good. A lot of good information there. Rec my recommendations: know who you buy from. If you're buying from an ANA dealer, they have to buy by code of ethics. And there's also mediation service in the ANA. If you're an ANA member, you're allowed to use that. If you have a problem with the dealer. P&G, they have a very strict code of, ex of ethics. Talk to people. If you've never dealt with a dealer before, they just pop up, ask people, do you ever see this guy? Who are they? <laughs> ask for an invoice. If a dealer won't give you an invoice of, of something, like say you're spending $500, why would you want to deal with that person? Every dealer I deal with, because I do sometimes resaling, I get an invoice. Every dealer out there who deals has a book that they'll write down, here's what I'm selling you and what it is. If a person won't do that, why deal with them? That should be a red flag. And if you've never saw the person before, why deal with them? There's too many good dealers out there. Beware about people who claim to know nothing about coins. I'm selling the stuff, but I'm not a coin dealer. I know nothing. 
Here's some common war extinguisher here. This is not mine. I inherited this. I'm just selling it. Well, how did you price it? I picked a number out. I don't have time to go to a coin shop to sell, but if you sell it, you can go and you can make money. I've heard that one before. You can resell these and make money. And of course, I know nothing. I ran into the I know nothing person at a military base because they had vendors coming in. She sat up a table like this with selling coins. And I go, oh, okay, it's unusual. But I went to her and she was selling Ike dollars, all common, everything was common. But the Ike dollars were $5 for circulated. State quarters were two, three dollars each. You know, really high price. And she told some people I was listening, yes, this is probably silver. 1970s. So I said, ma'am, uh, I can tell you people, that's not silver. That's just a 1970 dime. It's not silver. And she go, oh, oh, okay. So I figure, okay, she's a novice. I go back and I try to have her a red book because I have them upstairs. And I went back and said, ma'am, here's a free red book. This is called a guy, here's picked, and she turned and faced the wall and said, go away. Okay, this was kind of strange, but then I realized she intentionally wanted to know nothing. I came to, this was maybe a year ago, to uh, one of the Dalton shows, and a dealer came up to me and says, are you so-and-so? Yeah, I wish you did not talk to this lady. Um, who are you, and how do you know I talked to her? I give her the coins to sell. She is selling them as souvenirs. She knows nothing. So you're the one that's pricing them? No, I gave her a list. It's up to her to pick the price. Oh, and she was selling stuff to people like state quarter stuff that were circulated that you could get from the bank. And she told them that these were valuable 1970 dimes, 1980 dimes, half dollars. You know, the rare 2000 Kennedy half dollars worth $5 because they may have silver in it. And those kind of uh, people are out there. You go to flea markets, swap meets. Anytime you, you talk to people like this, I've been in other places and I'll just ask some basic questions. And I've had people say, you know more than I do, please leave. I don't know where the stuff came from. All I know is this is a price I'm selling it for. I don't know anything. Set a, a value, say $50, buy a slab. If you don't know about grading, to buy a slab, buy from a dealer that is reputable. Both PC, GS, and GC have apps. You can get it, you can do a picture. They're very reliable, very good information. So in conclusion, know what you're buying by reading the book first, look at examples that shows. If something doesn't look right, walk away. Your first impressions are always your best. If you have a question, feel free to get another opinion. There's no dealer there that I deal with if I say, can I take it, get another opinion? They'll say no. If a dealer says no, you can't get another opinion, say from a grading surface or something, walk away. Don't buy the item. No legitimate dealer would have a problem with you have this item to get a, a second opinion from a different dealer or a grading service. And again, I have a whole bunch of handouts here, so please take one of everything. They're more detailed that I could get into. Is there any questions from anybody? Yes, sir. Richard, I uh, call PCGS mm -hmm. and ask them a question if they could answer it. The first thing I do if I buy a raw coin right. is keep them away. And I know that you said that nowadays that may not even matter. Correct. But I like it. At least it's a little bit of information. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, what is there a percentage of uh, the reduction in weight that would indicate to me that it would probably be counterfeit? They could not or would not answer. My experience, I've weighed coins from this state down to fine. If it's more than five or ten percent, most of these coins that are false are thirty percent underweight, it's pretty obvious. If they're making underweight coins, it's gonna be so drastic. If you have something twenty percent underweight that looks mint state, that never came from the mint. They're so tight with their tolerances, they never would have made anything like that. And any war coin Normally, you may lose a few percentage of weight, but if you have anything that's double digits, that's a normally dead giveaway that's a counterfeit. The particular one I was talking about, I think it was 1866, uh, it had 
Mm -hmm. So that far back, you would think what, 15%, 20 percent Oh, they were accurate with half a percent because that was silver. Silver was a precious metal, so they were trying to produce something less than a half percent within their range, accuracy. So if you have a five or 10 percent, you know, description for a mid-state piece, that's a problem. Because the mint, you know, they were very tight with, with the silver and especially the gold plantions. Yes, sir. I don't know the actual weight. I do know the guy who was selling him. I read the article. It said that the weight was right on. They made sure the plastic was correct for the weight. Yeah, that's the point of weighing more than the slabs. Right. So how either they bought slabs or they were they took out coins to get the slabs to get the weight they wanted. But they said that the the actual slabs that you could buy for the counterfeiter weighed within their tolerance. I mean, see, it's just manufacturing. It's plastic. It's no different than making widget. It's the same material, same machines. They're just making slabs. And remember, you have three parts of the slab. You have the top insert, the bottom, or top piece, the bottom piece, and the insert, right? And the computer-generated top, they probably have a computer program that you could put in pictures or whatever you want on it. They make it easy. Yes, sir. Yes, I've heard that. And it's like, hmm, who could have the molds and everything to make extras? I wonder where they could come from. Of course, they say they never would have do that for an co American customer. Anybody else? Any other questions? If not, thank you for coming. Oh, yes. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. I didn't update it. PCGS also has a chip they're putting out. So That's sure. brand new. Yeah. Yeah, they so please. Oh, thank you. Let's give Richard a hand. Well, thank you very much.